it's Florence here and today I'm back again with another episode of my knitting video podcast. Today's episode might be a little bit shorter than usual, I have a little bit less to show but still quite a bit to talk about and I think having fewer projects to talk about does mean that I can spend a little bit more time speaking about each one and go over things in a bit more detail which is nice. Today my episode will be pretty much as usual uh, me just showing the projects that I've finished recently, the projects I'm currently working on, and I have a tiny bit of new yarn to show as well. First of all, um, a couple of small announcements before I get started. I don't talk too much about my actual pattern releases on this channel because I don't want this channel to feel too much like I'm constantly trying to sell you things, but I think that by the time this episode releases, hopefully this afternoon, I will have the pattern on Ravelry for these socks that I spoke about in the last episode. These are the Mountain Walk Chunky Socks, you can check the last episode if you want to hear more about them, but they are a DK weight faux cabled sock, they are a chunky version of the Mountain Walk sock that I released last year, so I have a fingering weight version of these socks as well, and I did say I'll put a pretty heavy discount on these socks if you already have the pattern for the Mountain Walk socks, since there is a lot of overlap between the two patterns. The second thing I wanted to mention um, ties into what I'm wearing. I showed this cardigan in the last episode, this is, uh, well, I haven't named the pattern or anything yet, I've been calling it the fennel seed jacket just because the colour of yarn that I use for this is fennel seed by Knitting for Olive. I'll talk briefly about it because I always begin my episodes by talking a little bit about what I'm wearing. This is a cardigan that I knitted freehand in Broken Rib. It's knitted in one strand of Knitting for Olive Heavy Merino and one strand of Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair. Both are in the colour Fennel Seed, which is one of my favourite colours that Knitting for Olive do. I really like this cardigan. I think it's really, really cute. And I was actually so surprised at the reception it had when I showed it in the last episode. I think a lot of you guys really enjoyed it as well. And so I am going to be writing a pattern for this. And what I wanted to mention is that I will be opening a call for testers. I will link it in the description, I normally just post about these on Instagram, and you do ideally have to have an Instagram account to test, just because I tend to share information relating to the test in Instagram group chats, but if you're interested in signing up that will be open until uh, probably next weekend. Okay, I will move on now, no more trying to sell you things, I'll show you what I'm working on. And I think everything I'm missing is from somebody else's pattern actually this week. I suppose I'll just jump straight in with the piece that you probably clicked on this video for, I would assume. It's uh, I think my only finished object technically, and it's definitely the biggest thing I'm showing today. This is the Celeste sweater, and this is a pattern by Petite Knit. I'm sure you've seen many other people knitting this jumper. I actually haven't. Um, I don't think I've seen anyone else on YouTube knitting this. Although I do have this thing where I definitely knit a lot of those sort of uh, planar Scandinavian patterns by designers like Petite Knit or My Favorite Things Knitwear, but when I watch podcasters myself on YouTube, I tend to watch a lot less of that stuff. I watch a lot more of people who knit really different clothes to me because I find it really interesting to hear about projects which I wouldn't necessarily knit myself. Anyway. Um, I showed this in the last episode, at which point I had just cast on, knitted the collar and the top part of the yoke, and this I finished really quickly actually. I think this entire jumper took me about a week and a half. I did knit the yoke entirely on the Sunday that I filmed the last episode. Actually, um, I was able to take this knit to work with me on Monday morning, which I don't tend to do if there are multiple balls of yarn attached to something, because it's a little bit much to manage at my desk. Um, so I'd already finished all of the colour work and split body and sleeve by Monday morning. And then progress was a little bit slower after that because it wasn't quite so interesting, as much as I do enjoy having a great big expanse of stockinettes in it. I still finished this in just over a week, which I think is quite fast considering I work pretty long hours at a full-time job, and this is DK weight, so obviously a little heavier than perhaps a lot of colour work garments, um, but it's by no means a chunky knit, you know? Okay. I guess I'll start off by speaking a little bit about the yarn. This is the yarn that I used for this project. This is Peer Gint from Samus Garn. It's 100% Norwegian wool, and actually I think all of the colours that I used, apart from this beige one that I used as the main colour, are those sort of special edition Petit Knit collaboration colourways. So I believe this pattern was released to promote those colourways, and clearly it worked well as I went out and bought a load of them. This is a relatively inexpensive yarn, actually. 
It is DK weight and has 91 meters per 50 grams. So even though each ball is really cheap, I think these cost less than four pounds in my local yarn shop, you do have to buy a lot of them to knit this jumper. Actually, this one took somewhat fewer than I was expecting. I think I mentioned before that one of my favorite things about this design is that the colors are distributed pretty evenly over the yoke. And that means that I believe for all the sizes, you only need one ball of each of the contrast colors to knit this jumper, which does cut down on the cost of knitting it a little bit if you're not using scrap yarn, because I find that I get a bit intimidated by patterns where you have to buy like five different colors to do color work, because I figure I'm going to be buying a lot of each and it's going to be costing me a lot more than a single colored jumper would. Actually, this jumper didn't cost too much at all. I think I mentioned in the last episode, mine is knitted in size small because I wanted a little bit more of an oversized fit. My measurements would put me into the extra small category according to Petite Knit sizing, I think. But for this pattern, Petite Knit has actually started making a size extra extra small, which was something that a lot of people in the comment section in my last episode seemed quite excited about. But heat knit sizing does run quite large, so it's really nice to have the option there for people who are smaller than um, the measurements that generally fit an extra small by her sizing, and also people who just want to size down for a less oversized look. I know that the amount of positive ease that she puts in her patterns really isn't for everybody, and so it's good to have more options there. Anyway, her introducing this size meant that all of the sizes are sort of shifted in how they're laid out in the pattern. And so I instinctively bought the amount of yarn specified for the second size in the pattern, thinking that was the small, and didn't realise until after I bought it that since there was now an extra extra small, I had bought the yarn required for the extra small. I just knitted the small and hoped for the best, and even though I didn't buy enough yarn, I think I bought nine balls of the main colour and the pattern actually called for ten, I still have this full one left, plus quite a lot of another one somewhere. So I guess I used seven and a half balls of the main colour, which really isn't so much. Obviously best to have a bit left over, especially this sort of amount, like I can easily use this to knit some sort of accessory. Uh, I did actually start a pattern in this yarn last year for some little bags that I never finished, and so maybe I should uh, <laughs> make another one of those. But I guess that means that in total I needed to buy eight of the main colour and then five contrast colours for 13 total balls which I think is the same amount of yarn that's required for the chestnut sweater, um, although again I had at least one ball left over from that as well. So even though it's colour work, the yarn consumption isn't that much higher, and I think that's really cool. I'll get a little closer and show you the yoke. As you can see, it's really pretty, a very sort of classic colour work design. I did follow the pattern almost exactly, apart from I think these black dots here are supposed to be in the main colour, so they're supposed to be in this cream, but I wanted them to show up better, and I wasn't sure they'd show up so well against the beige, so I switched it for the navy blue instead. This arrangement of colours isn't exactly my own original idea. I mentioned before, I think Petite Knit posted a picture of herself working on the toddler or baby version of this jumper, and this was the colour scheme that she was using for that. I didn't get the exact colour numbers necessarily, but I did uh, sort of write down what colours were used for that, and then I went into the shop and picked out colours that look so sort of similar. But it's very much the colour scheme that I reach for the most, some beige, some blue, um, it really suits my tastes I think. I will pull up the colours that I used, Sunless Garn yarn doesn't generally have colour names on the packaging, but I can give you the numbers because I did take a picture of them all before I started using them. Yeah, so the main colour is 2321, and then the blue contrast is 6050, the beige is 2542, the darker brown is 3070, and the really dark navy blue that looks almost black is 5591. As usual, all of the colours and yarns that I use will be listed in the description, um, so you don't have to try and find the bit in the video where I talked about it if you do take an interest in any of these colours. This is a yarn that I'm quite familiar with, I think. I've knitted quite a few jumpers in it. Um, it's really my go-to when I want to knit something that feels a little bit woolly and it doesn't have any mohair in it. It's definitely not a soft yarn, but at least for me, and I'm not particularly sensitive to wool, I don't find that it's too scratchy for me to wear against my neck. This jumper does have a higher neck, um, and I haven't worn it out yet, but I've you know tried it on and it's been fine. And I do have a couple of other jumpers knitted in the same yarn, which I haven't personally had any problems with. It's also a little bit of a thicker DK, which I quite like. It makes for quite a dense fabric, which I always think feels a little bit more luxurious, I really enjoy it. 
And it's not something I personally worry about too much, but for those of you who do think about it, which I know is a lot of you because I always get a lot of questions on it, this yarn seems to barely pill, at least compared to other wool jumpers I have. Um, my jumpers that are knitted in the Samus Gun Pig in just don't really show any signs of wear at all. I can actually grab a couple to show you. These are two of my most worn jumpers at the moment. This yellow one that I only finished a few weeks ago, so I wouldn't really be expecting this to show so much wear. But then this is the Moby Sweater by Petite Knit that I knitted well over a year ago now. I have never de this and you can really see I don't feel like there's any pressing need to de it. It basically looks exactly like new. Yeah, this yarn really wears exceptionally well. It also has a great colour selection, which definitely helps. I am positive I'll be going back and knitting more jumpers in this yarn very soon. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit more about the pattern. I found it to be really well written. I think something to keep in mind is that when you've knitted a bunch of patterns, particularly a bunch of patterns by the same designer, and I have knitted a lot of petite knit jumpers by this point, I don't necessarily read the patterns particularly thoroughly. Generally I know what techniques she's going to use, and so I'm basically just using the patterns for charts and stitch counts. And so I always feel a little bad when I say that this pattern seems really great, it doesn't have any mistakes, because in all honesty, if there was something that wasn't worded super clearly, I might not have noticed. There definitely wasn't anything that I noticed like that in this pattern though, and I have mentioned it in the past where she has had patterns that I haven't been the biggest fan of, the Moby sweater being a particularly uh, significant example of that, but I think this one is all around written really well. The chart is relatively clear to follow, I did sometimes find it a little bit hard on my eyes to figure out what colours were being used in certain places, because it's one of those charts where the cells are coloured in like four different colours, and sometimes it's a little hard to tell the difference between, for example, like a dog purple or like a black, I don't know. I don't remember exactly what colours were on the chart, but it definitely did strain my eyes a little bit at times. The chart was clear though, the increases in the oak are really not visible at all. And actually, I know this is something that matters to a lot of people. I think I will show you guys the jog in the colour work. For those of you who haven't knitted anything like this before, because you're basically knitting in a spiral for a yoke like this, there's going to be like a seam at the beginning of the round where the stitches will be sort of shifted up one and you get a full step. And this is something that you can use various techniques to avoid, but I didn't do anything like that here and the pattern is designed well enough that you can't really see the jog. So this is the back of the yoke. I'm trying to see in the viewfinder. I think it's down here. Um, and you can see it is, it is there, but it doesn't particularly bother me. I know a lot of people don't like having the beginning of round for their colour work be on the centre back when there's going to be a job like this, because I think a lot of people find it's less visible if you put it maybe along the back of your shoulder or something like that. But this doesn't bother me personally. I wouldn't say I'm particularly a missing perfectionist though, so maybe you feel more strongly about these things than me, but I showed it to you so you can make up your own mind if you're going to attempt this pattern. Oh yeah, short rows, I should probably mention. The short rows in this jumper are done after the colour work yoke is completed, but before you divide for body and sleeves. This works pretty well for me, I find. I've done similar short rows on a few other projects. Most recently, the Peacock Cardigan by Lena Holmes Sansa has similarly placed short rows and I really like them. I think if I was going to knit like freehand something with a decorative like lace or colour work yoke, I'd probably place them the same way because I really like how they look. The last couple of years I've knitted colour work jumpers by Sari Nordland as my sort of winter colour work project since I don't generally miss a lot of colour work. And some of those have had short rows that go into the underarm. So it's after dividing body and sleeves but pretty much immediately afterwards, so that the turns um, when you knit the short rows are under the arm. And I'm actually not the biggest fan of those. I didn't really like the fit, and I didn't really like how the turns looked in the underarm. Here, I think the short row turns are basically not visible. I guess I'll come back again and give you another close up. So I can't, I definitely can't even see them in the uh, viewfinder, but I assume they're somewhere over here. I mean, you tell me if that particularly bothers you. I don't think I can see anything. Okay, there's definitely one here. See? See there? There's one that's not quite so neat. And when I show that, it's worth considering this isn't a particularly forgiving yarn when it comes to hiding things like that as well. 
especially if you're working with mohair or alpaca or something with a little bit more of a halo, you really wouldn't see it at all. This is just a, a yarn with really good stitch definition, so if there is anything weird you're going to see it, and I just don't think there's much visible weirdness on this. Since I did talk a little bit about the yarn consumption, I should mention, I think I knitted it slightly shorter in the body than the pattern recommended. To be honest, I didn't read the, the pattern recommendation for length, I just knitted it to the length that looked good for me. But I think it is probably a little bit shorter, so if you like a longer jumper, as pictured on Petite Knit, you might need a little bit more yarn than I used. The sleeves I think I did to pretty much the same length. I think that's about all I need to say about this jumper. Um, I hope you find some of that helpful. I know it was a bit of an information dump, but I really, really enjoy knitting this. I think it's one of my favourite, or probably my favourite colourwork project I've ever knitted, and I look forward to wearing it a lot. I think this colour scheme is going to match really well with a lot of my wardrobe and be really easy to style, and my office gets really cold, so um, I think this might be a good one for work. Okay, so if that was the piece that you were all here to see, um, the next one you, you didn't know you were going to see at all because this is a new piece that I hadn't started in the previous episode and I didn't mention I was going to start in the previous episode either. So you might remember from, oh, I don't know, some point in the summer, quite a, quite a while ago actually, I knitted this scarf as a test knit for the designer Garnog Slicked. If you haven't heard of Garnog Slicked, you might know um, her designs from the blue square neck camisole that I've worn a bunch in my videos. Uh, summer top knitted in the knitting for Olive Merino in soft blue. It's my favourite summer top that I've ever knitted, I wear it so much. And since then I have knitted a few more of her patterns and also like had a look at some of the English in the patterns for her. Um, when I originally knitted the square neck camisole it was a Norwegian only pattern and I spoke a lot about how I knitted it anyway because I thought it was so cute even though I don't speak Norwegian and I ended up helping out a bit with um, like cleaning up the English translation. Her English is great, but you know, I, I read them through sometimes. And I knitted this scarf as a test knit in the summer. This is called the Brioche Bandana, I think, and I knitted this in Cardiff Cashmere Classic, which is probably, I mean, I think I can call it my all-time favourite yarn. I talk a lot about how I like the knitting for Olive Marina and Mohair, or how much I like the Sandless Garn Pigint. This is probably like the nicest yarn I've ever tried, it's just not something I reach for often because it's so expensive. The colour is called Circus, it's a really dark greyish green that I think is so beautiful. Anyway, I showed this scarf then, I think I wore it in a video as well, and I spoke about how I really like the organic shape, so it's brioche and I'll show you the increases. It sort of has increases on alternate sides, I don't know if you can see. It has a rotationally symmetric shape, which I really like. I just thought that it was really beautiful, I was really drawn to the organic shape that the increases gave, where the sides sort of curve outwards when the increases appear. I don't know, it's probably not for everyone, but I liked it a lot better than the Sophie scarf, which was sort of all the rage at the time. So, I saw Garnel Select was doing a call for testers for a chunky brush scarf, which is basically that, but scaled up to be absolutely massive. Um, and the yarn was sponsored by Izia, so I will say now, this yarn that I'm about to show was sent to me. Not sent to me because I'm going to talk about it on my podcast or anything, just sent to me because it was sent to all of the test knitters for this scarf. But yes, I signed up for the bigger size of the, I think it's called Brioche Scarf Chunky by Garnog Slicked, and I cast this on after I finished my last episode, and um, we've got quite far with it already. So, when I saw the call for testers up for the scarf, I saw that it was offered in two sizes. I don't remember how big the smaller one was, but the larger one was listed as being 190 centimeters long, which is quite long for a scarf. They always say that your scarf should be about the same as your height, and about 163 centimeters tall, so this is uh, long for me. But I signed up for the bigger size, and I don't want to seem like I'm, you know, greedy or anything, but there was a little part of my brain that was like, ooh, I'm going to get so much free yarn to work on this, like, this is going to be such a, a financially <laughs> beneficial test knit because I'm going to get all of this yarn that will keep me occupied for a really long time on a big project. Last time I knitted the scarf, it did use a lot of yarn and it took me ages. Um, my flatmate received the parcel last Monday with the yarn in, and she sent me a text with a picture of it, and I was like, that looks terribly small. I wonder if there's been a mistake. So I opened it up when I got home from work, and it contained a grand total of three <laughs> balls of this yarn. 
This is Izia Alpaca, I'm gonna say three. I hope it is Alpaca three. I think it's a 50-50 wool alpaca blend and it is a chunky weight chainette yarn. So yes, there were three balls. I was like, no way is this going to be enough. I checked the pattern, but because, you know, I hadn't had feedback from testers yet, it didn't say the yarn quantity yet. So I was sort of quietly wondering if there had been a mistake. And then I cast it on and started knitting and I'm now almost done and I'm going to easily get this scarf out of three balls of yarn. This is how much I have left. As you can see, the scarf is getting pretty skinny at this point. So I'm, I'm nearing, nearing the end of this project. So what I'm going to say is, if you want to knit something in Izzia yarn, which can be very expensive, if you want to try it out, this might be a really good project for that, because you can knit this scarf for a pretty affordable price. This yarn is just so airy um, and lightweight for how thick it is. It really does go a long way. I should probably look up some stats on this yarn, because that is the third ball, so I don't have a spare ball with like numbers on it. So I will look those up for you one second. Okay, so this is an I-cord spun yarn, so it's, a, I guess, chainette sort of a yarn. 50% wool and 50% alpaca, as I said, and it is really airy. It says that it has 250 meters per 100 grams. I never know why Izzia writes the yardage on their yarn pages like that. Like, it feels a little bit deceptive because the balls are 50 grams, so each ball is 125 meters. And it says you can knit it up on five millimeter needles, um, I am actually knitting this scarf up on 7mm needles, I think. So I'm pretty sure this scarf and this bandana are constructed pretty much exactly the same way. I haven't looked at both patterns side by side, but I'm finding the process is really similar to how I remember it being for the small bandana as well. You basically just work from one end to the other, alternating what side of the scarf you're increasing on. And I do want to say, if you haven't knitted brioche before, I think this is a really great pattern to start with. It's very easy, at least at the start, you have a really manageable number of stitches. And I think that everything is actually explained so clearly in this pattern. Brioche is something that I knit infrequently enough that when I go back to it, I have forgotten how to increase and decrease or whatever. And I have found that I didn't need to look up any other tutorials or any videos when I was knitting this scarf. The written instructions in the pattern were sufficient. Although there are obviously a lot of video tutorials out there, so if you do get stuck, you know, that's totally something you can turn to. Also, um, what you can do if you are worried about messing up, because brioche kind of makes me feel like a beginner knitter in like, you know, when you start knitting, you feel like if you drop a stitch and it lands down, you have to restart. Like you have no idea how to resolve that situation. And that feeling is very much in the past for me now. I'm quite comfortable cutting parts of my knitting off or just like ripping needles out and leaving a project with no needles in it because I know that I can fix the fabric easily when I, when I go back to it but I don't feel that way about brioche particularly. And so I do get a bit nervous. So something you can do is, you know, every, it's like a 36 row pattern repeat, I think. Every 36 rows, you can just uh, put a piece of yarn through. I think people call it a lifeline so that you know that if you mess up, you can always put your needle back through following this yarn and go back to that point without any problems. I started doing that uh, now and then at the start of the scarf, but it's been a long time since I last put the lifeline in. I'm feeling relatively confident. There have been a couple of incidents and I have resolved them, I think, so that they're not visible at all. Oh yeah, something I thought I should mention about this is um, how I've been joining new ends on where I've been connecting each ball of yarn. So this is, a, as I said, a three ball of yarn project, meaning there are going to be two joins in the middle of the scarf. And I tried a couple of different things when I was joining the yarn, which I thought I would show you in case any of you are interested for comparison. So the first thing I did was I tried to weave the ends in invisibly. So I just sort of stopped knitting with one ball, started knitting with another, and then I went back in later and decided to weave in the ends. The second thing that I did, I'm not so sure how easy I can find this, was I did spit splice the ends together. Normally when I spit splice yarn, I'll sort of unply the ends a little bit so I can cut them to half thickness before I try and felt them back together again. And since this is a chainette yarn, you can't really do that. But also since it is so light and airy, I found that when you felt two ends together, the yarn is compacted and becomes a lot thinner. And so you don't really need to cut them in half because the felting will return the double thickness bit to just being a denser version of the same thickness, if that makes any sense at all. I think it's rather telling that I'm trying to find where I spliced the other end on and I'm not able to do it right now. 
Ah, I got it, I got it. Okay, so the spliced part is right here. You can see this particular edge stitch is a little bit thicker, um, but the actual knitting looks fine on both sides. Not really any visible disruption. And then where I did join the other one by just joining a new piece of yarn and weaving the ends in afterwards, I didn't trim the tails so that I could easily find it to show it to you, but the ends are woven in between where these two tails are attached. And you can see it looks a little bit chunky, but overall not too bad. I'll show you the back as well. I mean, I don't think I can, I can see it at all on the back. So yeah, that was something I was a little bit worried about, given that the scarf doesn't have like a wrong side. Both sides are going to be visible when you wear it, and this yarn isn't one that can obviously be split spliced together, but both of those different joins worked, I think, really well. And so if you're working on a similar project, maybe one of those will work well for you as well. In terms of how I wove the ends in to make it invisible, I really just follow the way the yarn travels on the existing missing fabric, so I just weave in the ends alongside the other strands of yarn, and basically whatever stitch I'm doing that ends up being pretty invisible, especially with something like this where it's quite sort of airy and light, and the yarn compresses easily. This has also been super quick, I should say. Last time I knitted a scarf, I felt like it took at least as much effort as a jumper, but with a lot less interesting stuff going on. This has been so much faster than any jumper I've ever knitted. I'd say maybe I've spent like four nights knitting this, maybe for an hour and a half each night. Maybe that's way off, but that's kind of how much I think I've done. And I am almost done. So this is definitely something that you could knit within a week, just knitting in the evenings. It's a really, really fast project. And so I think it would make a really great gift if you don't want to spend too much on materials and you don't want to spend too much time knitting it, but you want to give more of a sizable gift. This this is great. And I'm very sort of anti beginners knitting scarves because it is the most boring project that you could possibly do. And in my opinion, a great way to get discouraged. I really do think you should just start with a jumper. But like if you're a relative beginner and you want to give this scarf a go, I think it will be fine, not too boring. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this pattern. It's pretty well written. I really like Helena of Garment Sex Designs pretty much always. And so I'm very happy to be working on it and it should definitely be done by the next episode. One thing I'm kind of uncertain about is whether I'm going to block this at all. I normally am very consistent about blocking everything that I knit, but I do feel like this is going to flatten out a lot if I block it. It will get a lot wider, I guess, which would be nice. But I don't know, I kind of want to keep it being really squishy like this. And it's not like it needs to fit or anything, it is just a scarf. So maybe best leave it unblocked. I guess I'll finish it and see how I like it, see if I want it to be wider or neater, and if that's the case, then I will block it then. Okay, I will speak briefly about this cardigan that I showed in my last episode, although I really haven't progressed on it. Now this is going to be the step-by-step -step cardigan. If you remember my step-by-step -step sweater, it's a jumper that I did a full-length tutorial for on my channel well over a year ago now, and I'm going to be doing a sequel to that where I show how to knit a cardigan instead. The problem is, as I was saying in the last episode, this is a much slower project to work on, because even though it's knitted at quite a big gauge, I can only really work on this when I can have my camera set up to film, so it's very dependent on daylight hours. I'm at work during the day, during the week, so I'm never at home during daylight hours during the week. So it's very limited to the weekend, and even then I end up often doing something during daylight hours, so I can't record. And so I think I was pretty much at the bottom of this cardigan last time, and uh, now all I've done is like properly reach the bottom and bound off. In fact, I haven't even fully bound off. I still have the final stitch um, attached to a stitch marker here because I need to show how to bind off the final stitch in the video and I haven't had a chance to yet. We just barely had enough yarn to um, finish that bind off. Weaving this in is going to be fun. I'm trying to set a good example for beginners in this video. Um, yeah. This is knitted in Noro Madara, which is a beautiful yarn. I've actually had a lot of DMs asking what this yarn is. It is very, very pretty. I will show you close up again, even though I did show it in the last video. It's a grey yarn with a lot of really sort of primary colour flecks in it. Like this blue, that's yellow, but there's also like green, orange, the whole rainbow. It's super vibrant. And so this is a really great rainbow yarn for people who feel like neutrals are their comfort zone, like me. 
I don't want to repeat too much of what I said in the last video since I'm sure a lot of you watched it. This is really soft, it's really nice, it's a little bit of a more expensive yarn. The one extra thing that I will mention because it's, you know, been relevant since I filmed the last video is that this yarn breaks really easily. I don't know if it's all of it or just the particular length that I was using for the bind off. Probably just that. But I found that when I was doing the bind off, the yarn broke constantly because, you know, you're constantly pulling it through stitches. So there's a lot of friction um, and it is just gradually ripped apart. And it's very easy to splice back together, but it was still pulling out and becoming very thin in places. And so I honestly don't have a lot of faith in this bind off. If that's something that you're worried about, then I would either pass on this yarn or just hold it with something else to stop that from happening. If you're holding it with mohair, it really wouldn't be a problem at all. But yes, I'm hoping that this bind off will like felt a little bit before any of the uh, really thin sections break. I don't know, we'll see. It doesn't change my love for this yarn. It is completely beautiful. It feels totally luxurious. I think this is going to be a really nice sort of casual stockinette project that I can carry around with me and knit out of the house since it does just use one strand of yarn and there's nothing very complicated involved at all. Yep, uh, hopefully there'll be more progress next time. I won't talk any more about it now. Okay, so I'm going to move on to talk about my other big work in progress. I'm not really counting that cardigan as my big jumper on the go at the moment, just because I do have to pause when I'm missing it for so long. So when I cast off the Celeste sweater, I was looking for something else to cast on. I always tell myself that I don't knit gifts. To be honest, I just don't like my knitting being a stressful thing. I like to knit for myself with no deadline, because knitting is supposed to be fun and relaxing, you know? However, two people in my life have asked for gift knits for Christmas, and I don't want to say no. And also I do enjoy, I enjoy giving people gifts. So I'm just making sure that I'm starting in good time for Christmas to avoid any sort of stress or rush. I mentioned a few episodes ago that my boyfriend asked me for a jumper. I knitted him a jumper, oh, what, like more than two years ago now, about two years ago. Last time I knitted him the zipper sweater by Petinet. I don't know if he wants to appear on my YouTube channel, probably not, so I won't put pictures of him wearing it in, but uh, it looks really nice, it fits him really well. It's a super successful project, one that I really do recommend. I think it works really well for people who don't wear sort of traditional jumpers. My boyfriend normally wears like hoodies or sweatshirts. And so I think the quarter zip style of the petite knit zipper sweater is really great for men. I just think it's a lot more versatile, like a lot more people will enjoy that sort of style. It also does look really clean, like when the, where the zip is put in, it's designed really well. It's just a really solid petite knit pattern. I do recommend it. The only thing is it's knitted at quite a large gauge. I think it's knitted on five and a half millimeter needles, which is great for getting through a gift knit quickly, but it is very chunky and he has complained that he can't wear it as much as he'd like to because it is too thick. Actually, uh, I don't think the heating in his house is working very well at the moment. So every time I FaceTime him, he is wearing it, which is nice to see. But obviously petite knit released a pattern a few months ago for a light version of the zipper sweater and he actually asked me if I would make it for him which I felt super honoured by um, and I went to a lot of trouble to track down some yarns in it and I have now cast it on so I will show you. So this is how far I've got with this one. I have really just started the yoke, I finished this double corded collar um, and I've done I don't know 15 centimetres of the yoke maybe. This is going to take me a long time. My boyfriend is lucky that I like him so much because this is going to be a bit of a mission. Also, if you're concerned about the sweater curse, I'm pretty sure that the fact that I didn't get sweater cursed when I was in like a new relationship and I needed him a jumper for the first time means that this like second jumper I'm knitting him is probably going to be fine, right? Like I think after you've knitted one, the curse goes away. Anyway, I'm using two strands of yarn to knit this. And I did think ahead and bring fresh ones so that I can show you. This is Loch Lomond from BC Garn. I think it's 100% wool. Yeah, 100% wool, 150 meters per 50 grams. It claims an 18 stitch gauge on four to five millimeter needles. I don't know, I would say this is a thinner DK. I don't know where it's getting 18 stitches from. It does fluff up quite nicely when you block it. Um, it has a very dry feeling and a soft focus look to it. Not so much stitch definition. I really do like it. It's slightly tweedy, 
there are some little black specks in it. The colour I have here is number six. I don't know, it's the light grey, I'm sure you can find it. And I am also holding it with this Alpaca One from Izia. This is in the colour E3S, which is a slightly darker grey than the Look Lomond. So they go together for a just slightly mild look, which I really enjoy. Oh yeah, I realised I never actually mentioned the big grey scarf. This is in the colour E2S from Izia, which is a colour that I have knitted a lot. Like, I think almost everything I've knitted in Izia yarn has been in the colour E2S. So E3S, you know, we're trying something new here. The reason I went for this yarn combination, I think I spoke a lot maybe two episodes ago when I just bought this yarn about why I got it. Basically, my boyfriend had just said he wanted this, he just described the colour he wanted as a light grey, and then I saw my friend Valentina from the shop My Ivory Room post that she had like 10 of these left in stock, and I did the maths for how many balls this would need for a size medium, and it was exactly 10. So I bought them all, um, it felt like fate. They were on sale, so they were really inexpensive, although this honestly isn't a very expensive yarn to begin with. Plus 150 meters per 50 grams, that is a lot of yardage for a DK, it is very lightweight. I did knit up a swatch, let's see, I have the swatches here, I, I'm really prepared today. So I did knit up a swatch with just the Loch Lomond, and I think I used a 4.5mm needle here because I think the pattern calls for a 20 stitch gauge and I felt like since it was a thinner DK I might have to size my needles up to get the 20 stitch gauge. And this is pretty much a 20 stitch gauge, in fact I think it came out slightly larger than a 20 stitch gauge. I never know how to talk about gauge, like if a gauge is larger does that mean there are more stitches per 10 centimeters, or does it mean the fabric turned out too big? Who knows? Anyway, <laughs> um, I think this is like, you know, 19, 19 and a half stitches on 4.5mm needles. And honestly it looks fine, I think that you could totally knit this jumper using just the Loch Lomond on its own. In fact, I think I know somebody who did, maybe Sophie Pearls on Instagram, I think she was talking about how she knitted her boyfriend this jumper with just the Loch Lomond and started knitting one for herself as well, so it was kind of her who inspired me to choose this yarn for it. Yeah, I think it would be fine, but I wanted it to feel a little bit more substantial and a little bit more dense. And so I did go to my local yarn shop, I bought some of these. These are really cheap, they're much much cheaper than mohair because I think they're 400 meters per 50 grams, so you often need two or three for a project. I bought four this time just to be on the safe side, but I really like how they feel. I'm sometimes a little bit sensitive to alpaca, but I haven't had any issues with this one in particular. And I like this swatch so much better. I really don't know how much you're going to be able to tell the difference between these on camera. This one is definitely floppier. It's not really transparent, but I don't know. It just doesn't feel as substantial. Whereas this one is like a substantial fabric. It feels thick. It's got a little bit more rigidity to it. Oh, you can kind of see it's not as like jiggly. <laughs> it's so hard to try and express these textures over camera. But I really like this one. I love the little tweedy specks in it. I love the texture. It's really dry feeling, but not scratchy at all, which is great for someone who is a little bit sensitive to wool, my boyfriend. So this is the one I ended up going for, and this came out as exactly 20 stitches on 4mm needles. I always get a little bit worried talking about paid patterns, so I don't want to give information away that I shouldn't be giving away, but Patina always puts up a lot of videos, or has Kimi at Monkholm, I think her name is, make a lot of videos on her channel about how to do a lot of the techniques and the patterns, so I don't think they're secrets as such. The way this pattern generally works is you do a provisional, not a provisional, a magic cast on, um, and then you like knit the collar, and you fold it back down and knit the life stitches together with the other half of the stitches from your magic cast on, which does give a really nice seamless finish, and I did do that last time I made this jumper when I made the chunkier version, but I really can't be bothered with a magic cast on. Like, if I can't see why it's strictly necessary, I'm probably not going to do it. And so I just did a regular long tail cast on and, you know, knitted my cast on edge together with my live stitches. And it's stretchy, you know, I think it looks good. I don't think it's bulky or anything. You can't see it at all. And if anything, it will just give a little bit more structure around the bottom of the collar, which I think is a good thing for a jumper like this. We'll see, once I add the facing for the zip, we'll see if this works out as well as the Magic Cast On would have. But honestly, I'm in love with this. I love how it feels. This fabric, I honestly cannot recommend it enough. If you're looking for a relatively budget-friendly yarn combination to do a DK weight jumper, 
Like, this is beautiful. It's so lovely. I should also say, like, I bought all of this yarn with my own money, the BC Garn and the Izzy for this jumper, but BC Garn seemed like a really cool brand because they're one of the only brands that is willing to provide yarn to designers sort of outside of Scandinavia, not only for the designers, but also for all of their test knitters, which I always think is really generous. And I may end up designing something in BC Garn, partly because I love it, but also because it's really cool to be able to offer my test knitters yarn to sort of compensate them a little bit more for the time they spend knitting for me. So I just wanted to say they always seem like a cool brand in that sense, and they have a lot of really interesting yarn. I've been really enjoying knitting this. It's just a plain raglan once you get past the collar and sort of quarter zip construction. And they're always really fun and comforting to knit. Something I can carry around with me, work on in little small doses, like a little bit and then put it down and then do a little bit again. It's just a really enjoyable project. And I think I'll have it done in time for Christmas. You know, say to me, oh, when am I getting that jumper that I asked for? And I was like, well, not before Christmas. <laughs> but I don't think I strictly committed to it being his Christmas present. I am getting him something else. And so, you know, if I don't finish it for Christmas, that is fine. But yeah, I love it. And I should probably make one for myself at some point because I really do like how these quarter zips look. I don't think there's anything substantially different between the men's and women's versions of the pattern. But I have always bought the men's ones purely because I feel very comfortable knitting something that I'm happy with the fit of on myself. Like, I think I can easily adapt a men's pattern to look right on me, but I feel a lot less comfortable knitting something for a man, particularly if it's not a man that can like try it on really frequently because he's not here. So I always buy the men's pattern so I can use petite knits guidance on like body length, sleeve length. And I think last time I made the zipper sweater, um, I was at uni, uh, he had injured himself and gone away for a while, and so he couldn't try it on while I was knitting it. And so I basically just followed the directions exactly, and the body and sleeve length turned out pretty much perfect. So that's really cool. <laughs> I really do vouch for this pattern. It's a good one. It's a really great pattern. It has a lot of short rows around the collar, this zipper sweater light, which um, I don't remember from the original zipper sweater, but I think there are short rows in the original one too. Um, and I'm just really excited to get it done and gift it. Talking of that, onto the yarn that I have bought since the last episode. Again, this is fully bought with my own money, this yarn. And a lot of my own money. <laughs> the other gift knit that I'm going to be doing this year is for my mum. My mum is, uh, we'll put it this way, I go for a run almost every day and I'm still like strictly the least fit person in my family and it's not close. <laughs> My mum is really into wild swimming and so she'll go and like swim in the sea and get out of the sea and like put her dry robe on and I asked her what she wanted for Christmas and she said she really wanted a pair of like woolen mittens that she can put on after she's been swimming. And so um, I wanted to make her a pair of colour work mittens. I don't remember if she specifically asked for colour work or if I just decided I wanted to knit a colour work mitten, but I have decided that's what I'm going to do. I did make an Instagram story where I asked for mitten recommendations from you guys and I had a lot of really great mitten recommendations come through. I always like asking on my stories because sure, it's something that I could look up myself on Ravelry and that I did look up myself on Ravelry. But the nice thing is if I ask on my stories then I get responses from people who've actually knitted the patterns that they're recommending and so their recommendations will take into account how fun it was, how well written the pattern was, which pretty photos on Ravelry can't really do, you know? I'll see if I can like find the pattern for the one I decided to do. I get really nervous putting other people's pictures in my YouTube videos because I'm scared they're going to like copyright strike my videos, but I'm doing free advertising, okay? So I'm trying to find some pictures and put them in. Probably in my Ravelry favorites. Yeah, so I had a lot of recommendations for patterns by Skein Deer Knits who does the Selbu Knitting Club, which is like a collection of Selbu mitten patterns. So these color work mittens. And in particular, the one that I'm going to be making, I think is called Marit. It's a DK weight mitten, which I thought was a nice compromise. I think that I like the more detailed color work, but I don't want to pressure myself into knitting fingering weight mittens on 2.5 millimeter needles before Christmas. So we're going to do DK and then, I don't know, maybe I'll make her another pair um, afterwards in a thinner yarn. They have these beautiful floral patterns on. I thought they were a little bit more unusual for a Selby mitten, 
but really, really pretty. I will also mention this other pair that um, I found also by Skane Donuts called Vic Farvet. These are beautiful. I think these are particularly unusual, and this is the one I would have gone for if I wasn't too scared of knitting something at a 32 stitch gauge before Christmas. Unfortunately, I am scared of knitting something at a 32 stitch gauge before Christmas. So these are, these are the long term goal, yeah. Anyway, I wanted to pick out yarn that my mum would like. She's uh, very environmentally conscious. She cycles to the supermarket to do all of her groceries. She buys a lot of British produce. Um, she always talks about how she wants to use more British wool in her knitting. She knits a little bit. And so I obviously wanted to find some sort of more environmentally made British wool for her. And so I went on my lunch break at work to another local yarn shop. I've mentioned before there are two local yarn shops in Oxford. There's uh, the Oxford Yarn Store, which stocks a lot of Izzia and Sanderskarn. That's quite a long walk from my office. I work right in the city centre. I went to the Wool Hound in the Covered Market in Oxford, which is really small and really cute and really central, so you can get there super easily. They have a really wide selection of yarn there, so there's a lot of acrylic, but there's also a lot of expensive wool, which is nice. And I found this one which I thought was perfect. So this is Erica Knight. Um, I have never used Erica Knight yarn before. I feel like it's sort of not so popular in the knitting communities that I'm generally a part of. But from the minute I saw this yarn, the first time I went into the Woolhound, it comes in like an Aran weight and a fingering weight. I got the Aran weight one this time. I wanted it immediately and I was almost buying it, but they didn't have the colour I wanted in a full sweater quantity. So I'm happy to try it now and then maybe when they have more of the fingering weight one, I'll go back and pick some up. So yeah, I got two of the Aran weight ones. These are 100 grams each. I really only needed 50 grams for this project. I don't know what I'll do with the other half. 100 grams is 180 meters, 17 to 18 stitch gauge. So this is definitely a little bit thick for the pattern, which wants DK weight. But here's the thing, I haven't bought the pattern yet. I don't buy pants so I'm like sitting down ready to knit. I am not sure about sizing on these mittens because I have huge hands. I have man-sized hands on like the body of a small woman and I think I might partially get that from my mum. I feel like she probably has pretty large hands as well. And so I'm a little bit worried about knitting mittens with a colour work pattern that might not be super easy to adapt to make them a bit longer. And so I thought that using a slightly thicker yarn might be a good thing. It doesn't look crazy thick. Like, Aran can be a really wide range of thicknesses. It's not a very specific term. And I think this, you know, is a little bit thicker than the, the pig in here, but not like hugely so. So I think this will work okay, fingers crossed. And the colours I have here are, does it say colours anywhere? 803 Fairfax Ecru and 801 Bennett Pale Blue. You know, I wouldn't personally describe this as pale blue, but this yarn says on the packaging, I think this is kind of cool, that the yarn is produced from fleece to yarn within less than 50 miles. So it's all sourced um, in Bradford and then treated and spun in Yorkshire. So not from my part of the UK in particular, but it is all made in one place in the UK and that's really cool. They have a lot of colours that are really beautifully, it's mild the word, I don't know. Um, they have a lot of really nice beiges and greys. I just picked these colours up because my mum really likes blue and I thought they would work out well for colour work. High enough contrast, but I didn't want to do black and white because I feel like that will show every little uh, tension inconsistency in my colour work and I'm not the best colour work knitter. So yeah, these cost me a lot. These were £17.50 each. Um, obviously that's fine for a gift for my mum, but like, I don't know, it still felt like a lot for two balls of yarn, you know? They feel good though, they're less scratchy than the pig end, I would say. So if you're interested in this sort of yarn, I would really recommend checking it out. It is really, really beautiful and the fingering weight version will probably come up a bit cheaper for a full dumper. Uh, that's usually how these things work. Hopefully I'll have cast these on before the next episode. I am actually really looking forward to knitting them because it's something that I wouldn't normally knit for myself, which I think will be really fun. Yeah, I guess I'm just going through a colour work phase at the moment. I do have one more thing that I didn't buy. This was sent to me. Um, and this was sent to me presumably because I have a YouTube channel, just to be clear. But I thought I would show it anyway because I thought it was really cool. So this is from a brand called Pigeon Wishes, 
which emailed me to ask if I wanted to be sent some buttons. Which is, you know, a little bit different from the yarn that I, I usually buy and show in these episodes. But since I'm knitting quite a few cardigans at the moment, I had this one done last week. Um, I have the, the Nora Madara one that's currently on the go. I have other cardigans planned in the near future. I thought the buttons would be really useful. So they said, could they send me some buttons? And I said yes. And they sent me this very cute box. Try not to dox myself by showing my address. <laughs> And it had two boxes of buttons in. Now, I don't know if this was a mistake or what, but the, the card kind of implies we find, uh, you are finding close to two styles from our limited edition collection. But there will be two types of buttons, but I actually have two of the same uh, type of button, which is a little bit of a shame. They come in this very cute little box. And you can kind of see they are beige with white and this like dark pinky red in them. I'll pull the whole tray out so you can see them all and how varied they are. They look really pretty. And these are a collaboration between La Petite Maison Couture and Pigeon Wishes. Yeah, I don't want this to become like a channel where I'm constantly advertising items, so I'll keep this sort of brief, but these are really cute. The only problem is that pinkish color in the buttons is a little bit too too pink for a lot of the yarn that I'm using at the moment. But I looked at how much these cost. They have them on Etsy and they're sort of nine to 10 pounds for enough buttons to do a cardigan. And when I bought buttons for this cardigan, buttons are on this side, I went into John Lewis and I ended up spending seven pounds on just the six buttons on this cardigan, no spares. And these buttons are a lot less cute than these guys. Shipping on these is pretty cheap as well. So even though these weren't the colour scheme that like perfectly matches anything I'm missing at the moment, I went on the Etsy and I ordered more. So that's how you can tell I'm showing this product because I really think it's cool. I ordered them in a really dark colour, like they're rainbowy but also kind of black, and I thought that would be perfect for a high contrast button for the Nora Madara cardigan. Obviously I won't know until they've arrived, they're taking a little while to arrive, which is not the fault of Pigeon Wishes. Postage for my flat is incredibly inconsistent. Royal Mail can sometimes take upwards of three weeks when normally it takes like two days, you know? So getting anything delivered is a pain. So fingers crossed they arrive safely, but I think that being offered these three buttons has like led me to find some really cute ones for that cardigan. And maybe I've spent like 20% more than I would have at John Lewis, but it feels worth it, you know? So yeah, hopefully I'll show you those buttons soon when I put them onto that cardigan. I think they're looking really cute. And I think that's everything for today. I managed to talk a lot for how few finished objects I had. Hopefully that's okay with you all. Oh, I should also mention, I've had quite a few comments lately about my lack of microphone. I think maybe this is partly because my camera's a bit further away from me right now, just because of how my room in this new flat is laid out. I ordered a microphone, which is very exciting. Unfortunately, even Amazon uh, can't deliver to my flat. So I ordered it with next day delivery quite a few days ago and it never arrived. Hopefully that means the next episode will have better audio. So thank you for sticking with me for the last year and a half on this channel while my audio has been not the best. I promise I'm going to fix it for you really soon. Thank you very much for watching. I will be back again soon, I'm sure, with another video and goodbye.